My name is Zaki Tirodi. I'm a technical st strategist with CrowdStrike. Um, today's session is going to go over a little bit about what we as a company, a security organization uh, as CrowdStrike, see every single day. Some of the things we've seen last year, but also looking into what we have seen from the trends um, of the adversary and actually looking into what we expect to actually happen from a cybersecurity landscape um, in the next few months and then the next year as well. So the session will be about 45 minutes and then hopefully we'll have a bit of Q&A and then most importantly, get you all off for, uh, for a nice lunch. So yeah, Zach, it's ready. Um, I've been working for CrowdStrike for several years. Um, my background is in security, instant response and threat intelligence. Um, I originally came from law enforcement and then worked for a number of cyber defense contractors and then ended up at CrowdStrike. For those who are not too aware of how CrowdStrike work and uh, some of the threat actors we're tracking every single day, we'll just do a quick little course. So during today's session, you may hear me start referencing some animals. Uh, I'm not going mad. This is just how we internally actually track some of the nation states and threat actors throughout the world. So if you hear me saying bear, I'm referring to a nation state adversary um, in Russia or has a um, maybe a consulting organization working on behalf of the Russian government. Say Panda, China, and then my favorite, I think one day I'm really waiting for the day I'm in a pub quiz and they ask this question. Um, the mythical half person, half flying horse of North Korea, which is the Chalima. So again, if you do win a pub quiz on that, on that answer, proceeds have to come towards me. We also have jackals, which are our hacktivists, our terrorist organizations, and then we also have e-crime as well. So first of all, let's look at the current landscape, what we've been seeing over the last few years, but most importantly, what's been going on you know, in 2017 and into 2018. Quick question, which one is the original? Any guesses? So on the right-hand side, you've got the US military's F-22, and you're on the left-hand side, you've got the China's J-20. Funnily enough, the Americans have been building and de designing this plane for several years, and they were quite surprised when the Chinese were able to launch something a lot quicker than they were expecting, roughly about a year or two before the actual first uh, delivery date from the American side. Now, of course, from high level, they look similar, but there's you know, some little changes. Actually, they're very, very similar. From a technical design point of view, the, the core mechanisms, the technology, the software, they are really, really similar um, uh, planes. So how did that happen? Now, since 2009, we've kind of been discussing publicly about Chinese and nation state threat actors. In 2009, we had what's called Operation Aurora. Uh, I'm sure everyone remembers that uh, very well. Um, Operation Aurora was one of the very, very first publicly referenced um, uh, incidents where large security and software organizations were breached. One of them was Google, and there was a number of other large American uh, software development houses that were also uh, breached by this unknown nation state, which was later actually attributed to China. Now, in 2015, Obama actually worked with the Chinese government and said, right, Let's stop this. Let's stop doing corporate espionage. We don't want you attacking our, our businesses. Let's come to a peace treaty. We are, we're okay with uh, intelligence operations because that's what governments do. They're happy to allow that. But let's stop targeting American businesses. And they signed the treaty. That's quite important because once America had did that, um, a lot of other organizations started to follow. We saw many uh, European Union um, entities do the exact same thing as well as other countries throughout the world. But then something happened, you know, roughly about a year ago that kind of changed that. Okay, anyone, any ideas? The White House changed, had a new boss walk in, and China decided to give up on that treaty and just see what happens. And we started seeing a huge uptick in those, again, corporate cyber espionage attacks. Now, from there, you know, we... It's no longer changing the shift. You know, previously, the last few years, it's been mostly focusing on intelligence gathering opportunities, but again, now we're starting to see organizations being targeted for many different reasons. I haven't ever tried to buy a large nuclear missile before, but I've got a feeling they're quite expensive. Um, 
and again, this is a, North Korea is you know, a name that we are seeing continuously pull up. They're supposed to be under sanctions, but they're, afford, they're able to afford mass amounts of military and defense projects, stuff that's not cheap to do. And again, you need very, very smart people to actually power it. Now, North Korea is actually quite an interesting subject. You know, several years ago, when we spoke about North Korea's actual cyber defense capabilities, you know, in the security industry, we kind of joked about it. It's North Korea, they will have no ability to kind of target us as a Western, you know, Western world. The reality is, cyber defense and cyber espionage is a core key area as part of the North Korea's business. Again, we mentioned they're under sanctions. So how do they make money? They're very, very clever on how to actually make profitability. Within the actual, uh, um, the, the core parliament buildings are of, uh, of North Korea is a small office called Division 39. In this small office, their core premise is to make money for the Kim's family, but also for the regime. Now this could be through legal or illegal methods. And one of those methods is cyber espionage. So having a quick look into Office 39 or Division 39, there's a few names for it, and something called the Korean Computer Center. Um, originally designed you know, in several years ago by the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, um, the main method was to create really, really smart people to create you know, cyber espionage capabilities, to develop tools inside DPRK, but also provide consultants to nations that are friends of the DPRK and the Kim's family to provide them cyber espionage capabilities. So if you're uh, um, you know, an African nation and you're looking to do cyber espionage yourselves but can't do it yourself, who are you going to call? Kim. Now, we've seen this organization do many different things. We've seen them being part of China um, criminal organizations, and basically they are the same principle. We talk about hitman for hire. These are hackers for hire with nation-state capabilities. We've seen them attack you know, India, uh, illicit billion-dollar funds. We saw them in South Korea targeting a number of games companies. Uh, we've seen attacking ATMs in South Korea and throughout the world. These are, again, very, very strategic, very, very capable individuals, again, available for anyone to hire it, and it gives us notice. But at the same time, also working on behalf of the Kim's family to provide their capabilities and tooling internally. Another aspect of something we started seeing quite frequently in, in 2017 is supply chain attacks. I'm sure we're all familiar with what happened at SeaCleaner, you know, a legitimate tool that was manipulated, changed to have the ability to have a backdoor implant installed if it was installed in a certain like, government or corporate environment. We all heard about WannaCry, uh, not Petcher. Not Petcher's first mechanism, exploitation mechanism, was actually taking over um, the supply chain of um, um, a Ukrainian tax accountancy software company. We see it again in Python libraries. Python is utilized massively by many different people, software organizations, developers, and maliciously targeting those libraries so people feel they can trust them. They're downloading something they download every single day, but actually in this case, in this scenario, it's been manipulated by a third party source. It's unfortunate we've become too trustworthy on some of the vendors, some of the technologies that we do not really know where it comes from but we need to make sure that those free solutions we may be utilizing every single day, we can validate, we can authorize, and make sure that we don't see this type of attacks happening to our organizations. Now, the next thing is what we call the trickle-down effect. Um, so everyone's familiar with GPS, I'm sure. We all have a satellite navigation system in our cars, in our homes, on our phones. Now, GPS was originally designed by the military. Eventually, what happens is the military spend millions and billions of dollars or, or pounds investing in a technology, and eventually they have to go, well, we can only take it so far. It's now time to hand it over to the public and allow them to take that technology, adapt it, and evolve it. It's the exact same thing we're starting to see from the cybersecurity world. Now, we all talk about the advanced persistent threats, the nation state, the APT. These are, these are very, very high sophisticated people and individuals and groups. These are groups with billion dollar budgets to try and target other countries, other governments and companies. 
They have very, very specific tooling that takes years of development and is specifically created for a certain type of attack. Now, when we start looking into like e-crime organizations or the everyday threat that we, most organizations are going to be targeted against, they don't have that same kind of budget. So we've always been reassured that they're not going to be as, as stealthy or, or as targeted as the nation state. So if we're not worried about a nation state, we're going to be OK, because oh, our, our, our attacker is immature. But unfortunately, those attack methodologies that have been designed by you know, the governments, the, the nation state adversaries, are no longer held to them only. They are leaked. They are, they, they are all over the internet today, meaning that immature organizations, e-criminal organizations, can actually look at the core base of this information and start utilizing it very, very quickly. One of the areas we start to see this is that the increased move in what we call malware-free attacks is, again, predominantly something that was utilized by the nation states. It's, it's a technique. OK, we call it malware-free. It does use some malware. But it's utilizing mechanisms that, unfortunately, the majority of traditional technologies cannot stop, cannot, cannot see. But that worked OK a few years ago when we were only worried about the immature threat. But today, that immature threat has the exact same tools, the exact same capabilities as the billion-dollar threat that you know, we should be scared about. Another aspect we saw again in 2017 is something that I like to call kind of like your, your fakeware. We all saw WannaCry, we saw NotPetya, and then shortly after that we saw Bad Rabbit. Now, these were disguised as ransomware. Most people today still see it as being ransomware. Ransomware usually takes a ransom. You pay that ransom and you get your data back. Now, these tools didn't work like that. These tools are actually destructive malware tools hiding themselves as ransomware. You know, we've seen NotPetya, the actual core payload and components of NotPetya resembles nation state tooling um, of KillDisk, which is actually attributed back to Russia. So what we've got here is nation states, those people we should be scared of, now utilizing you know, ransomware or ransomware-esque um, mechanisms or malware to hide themselves and targeting anyone, not just a specific uh, user group or country or, or company, actually just trying to destroy as many networks as possible for a certain reason. We've also seen um, early versions such as WannaCry being associated to you know, nation states such as um, um, North, North Korea, and again, using that as a mechanism of destruction. So let's go out there, cause some havoc in some large organizations, and maybe we'll make some money at the same time. E-crime. E-crime should be a subject that all of us need to look into quite, quite closely. Um, E-crime is massively evolving in the last few years. Um, we are now seeing this as, as a business. Not only a very, very you know, well set up organization and business, but also a group of people that are making a lot of money out of it. And when people make a lot of money, it gives them more reason to do what they're doing better each and every single time. E-crime varies. And it definitely varies depending on the organizations we're currently sitting in. You know, if we're a bank, you know, we're seeing ATMs being taken over on a continuous basis. Um, if we are everyday organizations, like exploits being utilized against us. One of the things that we've seen, again, is that maturity and that capabilities of the e those e-crime organizations. Previously, you know, they would use attacks we've seen over and over again. But they've realized something. Wanna cry, not Petra and Bad Rabbit told them something that we're really bad at doing. That's securing our networks against something we already know is bad for us. So, for example, those, those variants, those not Petra and so forth, utilize the Eternal Blue exploit packages, which we actually knew about four months before we saw the first Wanna Cry attack. Four months, we knew something bad could get into our networks, yet a lot of us did nothing about it. And that told the e-crime organizations that we don't care about our networks. We don't care about patching, updating. We know when something bad's out there and we should you know, start fixing it straight away. We don't. Not only that, they know that the first time something bad happens, such as wanna cry, we still don't do it. We then have not Petra, Bad Rabbit, and I'm sure there's many organizations today that still have this exploit available to them. 
So what they realized was to make sure that they're really highly sophisticated and they're able to get as much money out of you, because that's the core goal, listen to the ground, listen to what new exploits are out there, and adapt to them, use them straight away. So for example, one of the things we saw is CV 2017-0199, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows that one off by heart. Uh, basically, it was a, a word exploit. Um, basically allowed you to put any command in the header, and it would launch the command prompt to actually launch that command. It was very, very simple, but it actually opened a huge uh, backdoor to um, your modern, uh, up-to-date um, Word document, Word processing. We saw them in less than 24 hours from this CV being first reported to them actually utilizing code and adapting it to their, their, um, their delivery mechanisms. Less than 24 hours. Now, what that indicates to us is, again, these groups are listening. They're understanding, they're seeing the new vulnerabilities, but they have the capability to adapt that quick. Now, try and speak to majority of organizations. Could you patch your network in less than 24 hours? Most, unfortunately, most organizations will say no. Now, again, we talked a bit, bit about how e-crime is becoming a business. Um, you know, we, we know that a lot of these organizations have support systems. You know, if you get attacked by ransomware, there'll be actually someone on the other side of a phone. You can call a local rate number in your local country, and they'll walk you through creating a Bitcoin wallet. They'll walk you through how to actually upload your funds into that Bitcoin wallet and then send it to, to them, and they'll walk you through decrypting it. It's a very, very nice little service they're providing. And it's become a very, very illegitimate, legitimate business. And again, it's cheap to do. Anyone with some small amount of funds, any criminal organization with only a few thousand pounds in their, in their back pocket could start doing this, this themselves. If we look at kind of like the ransomware as a service product, this is anything from like $20 to $100 uh, per, per endpoint. Um, to buy a Trojan, you know, anything between $15,000 upwards. Exploit kits, again, they are a fraction of the cost. And then lastly, you need to have your bulletproof services. You know, your servers that no one could get taken down. You put them in illicit countries where, unfortunately, you know, court orders get lost. And again, they are literally tens of dollars a month. So again, with you know, small amounts of investment, any organization, any criminal organization can start running this kind of service for themselves. Another thing we started seeing more and more, again, this is actually something that we've seen an uptick in in 2017. And that's data as a weapon. Um, so, everyone familiar with the, the Fancy Bears organization? You may have saw it on the press during the, when the uh, Hillary Clinton's um, committee got targeted. We've started seeing nation states start using false information to avoid the reasons of what they're doing. We call it kind of like the, you know, the fake propaganda machine. They will see something they don't like, target them, and then push as much fake information out to try and point it away or, or make their reasonings justified. We st started seeing hacktivist organizations targeting companies, publish all the information, and start putting fake data in there. If you think about your Exchange server or your email server, let's say that email server, every single email gets leaked publicly. And then someone, every so often, puts a few fake emails in there. Let's say a small handful, 10, 20, 30. Do you think people would believe you when you say those emails are fake? The reality is when it's publicly in, in the, the public realm, people won't. There's so much real, why would they think it's fake? And we're actually seeing this type of attack every single day. So let's kind of look forward. So for us, North Korea is definitely going to be an organization we all need to look into. It's a nation state. It doesn't mean they're going to be interested in what we've got as a data-wise. They're just going to be interested in how much money they can take out of us. And this is not just going to be something they're just focusing on corporate organizations. They're going to try and get monetization wherever possible. They are actually a very highly capable tool developers. Some of the stuff they're making is, is, is amazing. I'm talking from a geek perspective, it's not great, but it's, they are very, very highly capable. They will definitely will start targeting more financial sectors, uh, mostly within the APAC region, but again, we start to see them kind of change up and move around. And they have a very, very core focus in Bitcoins, especially with the rate 
that Bitcoin's cost a day, their investment has literally times by you know, a million uh, since they started doing a lot of the attacks you know, last year. And again, simply by looking into the, 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 the actual geopolitical stance of North Korea, we can also see when the potential would uptick. Are we going to have more sanctions put onto them where they'll need to gather more, more money from other mechanisms? Again, looking at this information will actually allow us to understand our, 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 our threat actor that potentially going to target our organizations. E-crime, unfortunately, it's not going to go. We're also going to start seeing worms again. We haven't seen worms in the traditional sense for some time. But again, these e-crime organizations have started utilizing those nation-state technologies to be able to spread very, very effectively. They're going to use more exploits. They're going to listen to the ground and, and change up quickly. E-crime is definitely something we need to be worried about. And it's definitely something we need to make sure that when we go back to our organizations you know, today or tomorrow, we've got the right security mechanisms in place. Because this threat actor is evolving, it's changing, and it's not a single threat actor. It's many different organizations with many different backgrounds, again, purely wanting to do nothing but target your organization. And then hacktivism. Now, hacktivism is something we don't speak about quite a lot, um, even because sometimes we don't really see it. We've all heard about Anonymous, but we don't really publicly hear about them. The reality is hacktivism changes so quickly. And the reality is, if you think to yourself and your organization, you go, well, actually, my organization doesn't do anything bad. There's no reason any hacktivist organization or, or terrorist organization will ever care about me. The reality is they don't really care about you, but if you're a soft target, they will go for you. To them, it doesn't really matter who you are. Just to them, it's a goal and another method to actually voice their opinion. So you may think your business is, is completely unrelated with Hezbollah, but if Hezbollah have ability to uh, target your website to spread information, they'll do that. And again, it's something we always need to be aware of. It, again, it might be not make sense why they may be targeting us, but if we are an organization with a brand that's recognizable and our, our, our website or data spreads far, then they, we are of interest to them. So what are the steps to take? And what are the things that we as CrowdStrike are doing to kind of change that in cybersecurity? So take that, understand the threats and what's, what's actually going to be targeting us and how can we actually make a difference? So one of the things that most people ask me is how do we know about this information? You know, we are collecting 80 billion events every single day. We're processing this information. And basically, we are able to understand what the threat landscape looks like around the world at any given second. To kind of put into, uh, into kind of like ideas, um, unfortunately, I don't think you can see the screen very well. Um, roughly about um, Google gets around 12 billion search requests every day. I was quite amazed. I thought it would be a lot more, but 12 billion search requests every single day. Um, tweet, uh, Twitter receives something along the lines of like 2 billion tweets every single day. Um, again, I, I was quite surprised. I thought it would be a lot more. And again, we are looking at 80 billion events every day. So it's a large amount of information. To do that, it's all great having data. Data is lovely, but if you can't do anything with that data, it makes no sense. It's just a big, uh, big cost for you in storage. So one of the things that we've done is we've designed our own graphical um, data store. Um, this basically allows us to put lots and lots of information over a long period of time. It could be unrelationable information and start making sense, start pulling the relationships into it. it what that allows us to do is it actually allows us to kind of fingerprint the, the way the attacker walks. So not only are we looking at something like simple as like hashes or, or IOCs, we're actually understanding how someone walks within a network, how they type, how they may make a certain misspelling. Think of it like a CCTV camera on the actual threat actor. And we're able to then to utilize that data to track those threat actors across the world. To kind of put that into kind of perspective, we're seeing about two intrusions every hour um, with, with a number of different organizations. And we're analyzing this information to be able to provide threat intelligence, but most importantly, protection back to our customers. So taking all that, you know, there's a lot of information there today. What can we do as organizations to actually protect our, our, ourselves? And you know, for us, we've kind of put it into three core areas. So first of all is adoption of the cloud. 
unfortunately, a lot of organizations are quite hesitant when we start talking about cloud. Um, but you know, digital transformation is going to happen, and it's a lot more cost effective operationally. But the reality is, from a, from a security aspect, it allows us to be a lot more agile. When we're utilizing the cloud rather than physical infrastructure, it means that we can start segregating networks within a few seconds. It means we can start taking down parts of our network or bringing them up or adding new rule sets, again, in a few seconds. When, when we look at physical networks, unfortunately, it means we have to go running down with a, with a cable and plug and change up. Whereas with the cloud, it provides that agility. The security threat is very, very quick. And we need to be as quick as they are targeting us to target them back and protect our networks. And the cloud really allows us to do that. It also allows us, when done correctly, to have a very, very secure infrastructure. Of course, the caveat is there when it's done correctly. Another aspect is leverage threat intelligence. And what we mean by threat intelligence is we're not just saying go and take a load of IPs from an open source location. Choose an intelligence partner that's right for your business, that's going to be able to see the information that's going to be targeting you and provide the data that you need to be simply aware when something bad may be happening in your organization. Also, don't look at intelligence as a, as a, as a detection mechanism. Start looking at intelligence as a way that you start designing your own security postures. Start looking at it from a strategic point of view. Are you making new investments or looking to like redesign your architecture? Use intelligence. Intelligence actually will allow us to understand how the threat actors that we are mostly interested in. Again, you know, we talk about a lot of threat actors uh, targeting a lot of organizations, but the reality is for you, your organization specifically, will have a different threat actors of interest than another organization. So use intelligence to understand who is your target, who is going to come after you, what are their tools, their techniques, and, and their policies and procedures, and build your architecture and your security infrastructure and operations around that. Intelligence allows us to have a better focus when designing our own internal security policies, as well as allows us to be more tactical and strategic and also operational. And lastly, um, this is a word that unfortunately has been utilized in some senses wrongly. Um, we talk about threat hunting. Utilize tools in your organization to start looking for what you know is, 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 is strange, suspicious. Use visibility, use your SIM, collect logs, and proactively look at that information rather than just waiting for detection to come up. You're all practitioners of your network. You know your network inside and out. You know when, you know, Bob, in HR is doing something they shouldn't do. So use that knowledge of your network to proactively look into the data sources we're collecting. Find that something that's suspicious, investigate it, and of course, try and find the bad guy operating our network. And lastly, I think we need to stop bringing uh, you know, uh, knives to a gunfight. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases when it comes to security, we're just using the wrong technologies. In some cases, we've got technologies that we've just never used properly. So let's take a step back, look at our, our security stack, and make sure we're choosing the right technologies for us. Because security can be easy, but unfortunately, in some cases, we just make it too hard. So take a step back, look at it, and rebuild that strategy and that stack. Thank you very much. That's the end of the presentation. I'm, I'm very I hope, happy to open the floor to any questions um, that anyone may have. If not, we'll be upstairs around lunchtime anyway. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, leading up to the GDPR deadline, do you anticipate uh, types of attacks or styles of attacks to change before or after that deadline? So unfortunately, I think the threat actor knows that we will probably not be ready when GDPR comes into play. and the, the threats won't change. I think for us personally, we need to kind of change our own mentality when it comes to GDPR. Some people have been very, very focused and some have been being quite laxed. Um, you know, GDPR has many different functions. You know, we, we need to have our DPOs and, and look at how our data is being preserved. But there's another side of things as well as, you know, potentially we are going to be fined. 
How do we protect our own business, even if we do all the right things? How do we as an organisation know that if we suddenly get a knock on the door and we have that multi-million pound fine, we can securely and safely go, that's a mistake. Do we have that ability today? And I think, unfortunately, not. I don't think the styles of tax will change, but we definitely need to change when we're looking at security. You mentioned about embracing the cloud. Now, how do you... I'm sorry. Yeah, you mentioned about embracing the cloud. Now, are you referring to private cloud or uh, public cloud? Because if it's public, how do you actually maintain security when you've delegated to somebody else? So actually... This is the great thing about cloud providers. The cloud providers are massively forward when it comes to certification security than we are in our own internal organizations. They've done all the work. They have even shaped um, security policies and, and compliances for the last 10, 15 years. But we've, we've been a bit of a, unaware of this. So when we talk about cloud, we're talking about whatever cloud is best for you, so that could be public or private. But the reality is, if you actually look into it a little bit further, these are some of the most secure data centers in the world, a lot more secure than our, 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 what we would classify as internal secure data centers. And they are literally forward thinking when it comes to security policies and compliance. And they've been doing that for the last 10, 15 years. But unfortunately, I think a lot of us have, don't realize that and have not been able to embrace the cloud yet and not looked into that information. So is there another question? What's your thoughts on physical threat in terms of um, people's infrastructure? Because this isn't just about what's coming over the internet or cyber. And how would you deal with something like protecting the President's Club? So, so physical security, so I think a lot of people forget that we will, when, when we put the walls up so far, when someone can't reach us from, from afar, they will go physical. Um, Physical security needs to be treated as important as cyber security. And again, I, I, one of the things that we do is, from a physical point of view, is intelligence. Understanding, again, where your infrastructure may hurt. Understanding if, your, if one of your employees goes to another country, um, who may be targeting you. So and the reality is, I think, majority of organizations need to have same way we have kind of CISOs, we need to make sure that those CISOs are the same principles from a physical security. And a lot of organizations, what they'll do is they will have you know, their, their core officers in charge of both aspects because they're very, very relatable. 